Okay, order du jour. Government orders, government bills commons. Debate at second reading on Bill C-16, an act to amend the criminal code. Uh, Mrs. Yellick for Mr. Nicholson, seconded by Mr. Merrifield, moves that Bill C-16, an act to amend the criminal code, be now read a second time and referred to the Standing Committee on Justice and Human Rights. Debate, the Honourable Member for Edmonton, St. Albert. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Speaker. It is certainly an honour for me to rise today to begin second reading debate on Bill C-16, ending house arrest for property and other serious crimes by serious and violent offenders. Mr. Speaker, this bill aptly named proposes to restrict the availability of conditional sentences in the same manner as advanced in the former Bill C-42 in the last session of this Parliament. Mr. Speaker, our government is taking further action to crack down on crime and to protect the safety and security of our communities. Mr. Speaker, a conditional sentence of imprisonment is a sentence of imprisonment of less than two years that a court may per permit an offender to serve in the community under conditions and under supervision. Bill C-16 proposes amendments to the Criminal Code to ensure that conditional sentences are never available for serious and violent offenders and serious property offenses which were never intended to be eligible for a conditional sentence in the first place. Yeah, yeah. Let me be clear to all members of this House, Mr. Speaker. This government's proposed legislation would ensure that house arrest is no longer used for offenses for offenses that pose a significant risk to law-abiding citizens. Mr. Speaker, conditional sentences of imprisonment came into force over 13 years ago with the proclamation in 1996 of Bill C-41 entitled Sentencing Reform, which is found in Chapter 22 of the Statutes of Canada, 1995. Mr. Speaker, among the key elements of that legislation were the following. The creation of conditional sentences as a new sentencing option, the first ever parliamentary statement of the purpose and principles of sentencing, which are contained in Section 7, 718 and 718.2 of the Criminal Code of Canada, and increased emphasis on the interests of crime victims, including the recognition that the harm done to victims should be, consider should be considered at the time of sentencing. Mr. Speaker, as originally enacted in 1996, a conditional sentence was, was available as a sentencing option provided that the following prerequisites were met. First, the sentence must be less than two years in duration. Secondly, the court must be satisfied that allowing the offender to serve the sentence of imprisonment in the community will not endanger the safety of the community. And thirdly, the offence must not be punishable by a mandatory minimum term of imprisonment. Shortly after the implementation of Bill C-41, and in response to concerns that courts were awarding conditional sentences, sentence orders for quite serious offences, a requirement was added that the court be satisfied that the sentencing the offender to serve a conditional sentence of imprisonment is consistent with the fundamental purpose and principles of sentencing as set out in the Criminal Code. <clears throat> As I said, Mr. Speaker, the fundamental purpose of sentencing as described in Section 17 of the Code states that a sentence must contribute to respect for the law and the maintenance of a just and peaceful and safe society by imposing just sanctions that have one or more of the following objectives. First, denouncing unlawful conduct. Two, deterring the offender and other persons from committing offenses. Three, separating offenders from society where necessary, four, assisting in the rehabilitation of offenders, five, providing reparation for harm done to victims or to the community, and finally, promoting a sense of responsibility in offenders and acknowledgement of the harm done to victims and also harm done to the community. Mr. Speaker, the preconditions for a conditional sentence, along with the deemed aggravating factors added to the Criminal Code by, C by Bill C-41, such as the evidence that the offender abused a position of trust were designed to screen out serious offenses committed in circumstances for which den denunciation, general deterrence, and incapacitation should be considered the primary sentencing objectives. In addition, the fundamental principle of sentencing is that a sentence must be proportionate to the gravity of the offense and the degree of responsibility of the offender. Mr. Speaker, in 2000, the Supreme Court of Canada held in Regina and Pruo, 
that the conditional sentencing regime does not exclude any category of offenses other than those with a minimum period of incarceration, nor is there a presumption for or against its use for any category of offense. The court said, however, that it was open for Parliament to introduce such limitations. Unfortunately, sentencing, sentencing courts have interpreted the availability of conditional sentences in an inconsistent fashion because of the lack of, career, of clear parameters allowing, in some instances, violent and serious offenders to serve their sentence under a conditional sentence of imprisonment. This, unfortunately, Mr. Speaker, has resulted in criticism of the sanction and a loss of public confidence in the administration of justice and, I would submit, in the justice system overall. This government responded expeditiously to these concerns when it took office by tabling in May of 2006 Bill C-9, an act to amend the criminal code, subtitled Conditional Sentence of Imprisonment. As introduced, Bill C-9 proposed to eliminate the availability of conditional sentences for any offenses punishable by a maximum sentence of 10 years or more that were prosecuted by indictment. This would have caught serious crimes such as sexual offenses, weapons offenses, offenses against children, but also serious property crimes such as fraud and theft over $5,000. However, Mr. Speaker, as ultimately passed by Parliament, Bill C-9 only further restricted the availability of conditional sentences by excluding terrorism offenses, organized crime offenses, and serious personal injury offenses that are punishable by a maximum sentence of 10 years or more and when they were prosecuted by indictment. As defined by Section 752 of the Criminal Code, a serious personal injury offense has two components. First, it is defined to specifically include the three general sexual assault offenses, which are contained in Section 271, 272, and 273 of the Criminal Code that are used for adult and some child victims. However, Mr. Speaker, the second component of a serious personal injury offense does not provide the same certainty because it includes indictable offenses other than high treason, treason, first degree murder, or second degree murder involving the use of attempted the use or attempted use of violence against another person or conduct endangering or likely to endanger the life or safety of another person or inflicting or likely to inflict severe psychological damage on another person and for which the offender may be sentenced to imprisonment for a term of 10 years or longer. And Mr. Speaker, it is this, it is this aspect of the existing con conditional sentencing provisions that are so problematic. And this is what the bill before us today addresses. Rather than leaving it to the individual courts to determine whether a particular case qualifies as a serious personal injury offense, this bill clearly identifies all offenses which will never be eligible for a conditional sentence. Mr. Speaker, it removes the uncertainty, provides clarity to our law. Up until the coming into force of Bill C-9 on December 1, 2007, sentencing courts only interpreted serious personal injury offense for the purposes of determining whether the threshold for a dangerous or long-term offender application had been met under Part 24 of the Criminal Code. This, Mr. Speaker, is because the term had been enacted and defined for the dangerous and long-term offender provisions only. Since Bill C-9 came into force, courts have had to interpret the definition of, quote, serious personal injury, unquote, offenses in the context of conditional sentences, a context, Mr. Speaker, which is quite different than that for dangerous and long-term offenders. For instance, in the Queen v. Becker in 2009, a decision of the Alberta Provincial Court, and in the Queen versus Thompson, a decision of the Ontario Court of Justice, the courts were asked to determine whether the offense of robbery was a serious personal injury offense in the context of the availability of conditional sentences. In both cases, Mr. Speaker, threats were made, yet in only one of the two cases did the court ultimately find that robbery met the definition of a serious personal injury offense. In other words, the eligibility of the same offense, in this case robbery, for a conditional sentence was interpreted differently by these two courts, with the result that a conditional sentence was available in one case, but not in the other. Clearly, Mr. Speaker, that inconsistency needs to be resolved.